Shapiro. How are you, man? Hi, Dylan. How's it going? Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. This is uh, quite an honor and a privilege for me uh, getting to interview a guest on the other side of the world, like quite literally on the other side of the world. <laughs> my pleasure is all mine. Thank you so much. Um, this is the part where my wife recommended that I like fill in any Australian joke that I have, uh, but I felt like that would get a little bit uncomfortable and awkward. So I just, I'm going to skip all of those unpleasantries and just say, thanks for joining me all the way from Australia. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself and give me and those who are listening a little bit about your background. Um, I've been following you or we've been connected on LinkedIn for, I don't know, a handful of months now. And what really stood out in my mind is I feel like it's once or twice a week that I jump on LinkedIn and I get engaged in, into someone's thought that uh, really draws me in. It really kind of provokes some sort of emotion. And I swear, half the time it's you. <laughs> so it was from that that I was like, here's a guy I've got to get on the podcast because I think he could give a lot of great insight and information to those who listen to the podcast. So thank you very much. On behalf of everyone who's listening, thank you very much. Um, let's go ahead and jump into it. Let me, uh, let me hear a little bit about your background and uh, how you got into the UX industry. You've been in the industry for quite a while, uh, but I know you've also done a handful of contract work uh, in the industry. So just tell me a little bit about how you got into UX and how you got to where you're at today with Fox Sports. Sure, definitely. So I actually started my career uh, at the very beginning as a web designer and developer. Um, I'd actually gotten interested in that because at the time I was in high school and I was playing a game called Neopets. And one of the things uh, everyone had was um, a guild and a lot of those guilds had websites. And I thought, hey, I've got a guild, I should set up a website. And I jumped on something called GeoCities Website Builder at the time, which is a kind of drag and drop interface that would let you put together a very basic uh, kind of website. Um, and, and that really intrigued me. I was, I, was, I was quite fascinated by that and really enjoyed doing it. And over time kind of became better and better at that. Um, and I started um, doing work for friends and family and small businesses, built up a portfolio. And then I got my first corporate job at Virgin Money in Australia. Um, as a digital producer, which is like a website designer slash developer uh, slash content producer. While I was there, um, I got exposed to a lot of the work the marketing team was doing around micro research, user surveys, A-B testing, conversion optimization. And that really fascinated me. Um, and I started to lean more into that side um, of the fence and starting to learn about why we do certain things, what is the research and analytics and insights behind the decisions that we make and started to move more in that direction. And that's what kind of led me into the UX space. Um, and then from that point, uh, worked in a number of different places from finance to telecommunications to agency side. I did quite a bit of contract work, uh, which really helped me get a lot of uh, variety and diversity um, around my thinking as well as around the uh, items that I had in my portfolio and I was able to demonstrate a lot of diversity there. Yeah. Um, yeah. And just continued down that pathway um, until more recently, about a year ago, I started working at Fox Sports Australia, uh, which is a fantastic opportunity. And I really love working there. Um, and that was when I transitioned from the contract side to the more permanent full-time side and start to grow my career uh, over there. I've got a handful of questions off of that now already. <laughs> Let me ask you, what what was it that as a developer, or I guess coming from a more developer background, what was it about the research side that really got you interested? Because I don't see that transition maybe happening because of the research for a lot of developers. So what was it that caught your attention there? Well, f for me, what intrigued me was thinking about who were we, who we were designing for. Um, I think my mindset initially was, um, here is a, uh, an item that we need to develop or produce. Um, here's a brief, so to speak. Um, and once I kind of tapped into who and what type of demographic they belong to, what types of needs they had, um, and, and the thinking around that kind of pulled me in. I was especially fascinated with things like A-B testing and conversion optimization. So something as simple as changing the button color of a call to action, um, you know, from red to green and seeing, oh, wow, that had like a 10% increase in conversions. What, what? <laughs> right. So that, that, that psychology kind of aspect um, of it and the 
um, the numbers behind it kind of, for some reason kind of drew me in. Um, and I was lucky because I was able to kind of have my feet in both spaces at the same time um, and, and make that connection between the two and uh, work with the marketing team, understand who were we designing for, why the brief was the way that it was, what kind of testing we needed to do. But at the same time, I was writing the code as well and building it and producing it. Um, so having that end to end uh, kind of experience of the why to the how and then ultimately what you produce, um, that, that was really enjoyable for me. And then you, did you just continue to sharpen your UX skills via the contract work that you're getting exposed to? Yes, correct. So at, at that time, it was probably about eight or nine years ago, there wasn't a great deal of UX formal education that was around in the market. Yeah, right. And it, it really just came with um, practicing the skill sets and seeing what was available online, uh, working closely with other departments like marketing, um, like um, with, with the business and understanding how business goals and um, correlate with the work that I'm doing. Um, that kind of hands-on experience is what really helped me refine and develop my craft. Um, and yeah, over time just made uh, enough mistakes that I stopped making those mistakes and uh, worked with enough people that, I, that it, it gave me a very wide, diverse view of um, what the craft of UX really entails. Um, and yeah, it brought me to where I am today. Yeah. And was that while you were all located in Australia? Correct. Yes. So what were you doing to land contract work year after year for all, for all that time? I mean, contract work is not something that just falls in your lap. So what were you doing to continue to make sure you had something on your plate? Well, I was very, very active with my personal brand. Um, so my portfolio, um, probably has gone through about 50 to 100 iterations. Oh, okay. uh, it's, it's always been <laughs> my little pet project. Yeah, uh, It was never something that I just produced and said, okay, this is enough to get me a job. And then I would leave it until the next time I needed to get a job. Uh, I never saw it like that. Um, it wasn't a chore. It was something that I genuinely loved and wanted to see grow and develop and really bring across who I was as a person and at the same time who I was as a practitioner um, and, and really get the, 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 the people viewing the portfolio to get a sense of who I am, what I uniquely bring to the table. Um, and at the same time, in parallel, I was very active on, uh, on social media. So like your, uh, your LinkedIn's, the Twitter's, um, I recently started writing for Medium. And, and just really putting myself out there and just being an active voice, um, that that really helped quite a lot. Um, I guess another thing as well is just networking with uh, recruiters. A lot of the contracts uh, that I worked on were me being in house with the with with the company that where I was doing the actual work. Uh, so it wasn't like a, uh, that makes sense. Yeah, it wasn't like a, a freelance kind of working from home type of um, gig. It was more I would be contracted to be at a company nine to five, Monday to Friday for like three, six, 12 months, depending on the length of the contract. So kind of work like that. You know? Right. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. That's cool. I mean, cause I've got a handful of conversations that I've had recently with some UX designers who are uh, here in, in the tech bubble that we've got created here in Utah, who are struggling to land a full-time position, but there's contract work that keeps bubbling up. And I keep saying, you know, UX contract work is in demand. Uh, but how you can get yourself out there, it seems like that is the tricky part. How you can start lining up one piece to the next piece is the tricky part. So for you, you would say uh, networking with those recruiters and getting in front of them and then also actively getting out on the Internet. That's kind of what it was that helped you line those things up. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, the, network is in, the networking is important. Um, I would say the portfolio is probably even equally as important, if not more important. Um, I think it's particularly for UX, uh, a lot of the advice I've seen around UX portfolios is that you obviously need to have really solid case studies. You really need to demonstrate the UX thinking and all of that. Mm -hmm. But I think what often gets ignored is the UI design and visual design has to be fantastic as well. When you're trying to get a role, um, you're going through a number of different gatekeepers, so to speak. So you might have a recruiter that's initially looking at your portfolio. 
they're not necessarily a UX specialist. They're not going to look at your case study, synthesize it and see, hey, this is great UX work. Right. What they're looking at and, and trying to assess is, does this look like a high quality um, object, so to speak, on, on in the portfolio itself? Yeah. Um, does it look good? Is it presented nicely? Is the typography on point? Are the images like they're, they're looking at more the UI design and the visual design side of things. And they're seeing that there's case studies there yep. and that they look like case studies. And that's the first gatekeeper. So if you're able to address um, that type of persona, so to speak, and what sort of elements they're looking for, you're able to pass through to the next level, which might involve a little bit more analysis of the actual UX thinking um, that's involved around the case studies. Um, so yeah, never discount how important visual design and UI design is on in a UX portfolio. That's helped me tremendously along along the way. And it, make, and it makes you stand out from the 20, 50 other portfolios that that person might be looking at that day. Um, it, it, it's like, oh, let me go back to that one. What was happening there? It, it was, it, it was something I remembered. Um, and yeah, that, that would be my advice around that space. <laughs> I think you're spot on. That's excellent advice for anyone listening. I think that's spot on. We just finished, uh, two weeks of interviewing for a couple positions that we have available at Domo. And in those interviews, it was actually really interesting to see how much weight or I guess validation might be the the better word, how much validation we put into a candidate with just a really good looking portfolio. I mean, with outside of like looking into the nuts and bolts of it without reading case studies, without looking at just how good that first impression of a portfolio was really went a long ways with the team before we go next. All right, next, next. Oh, let's look at this one for a second. You know, it, it really did start to stand out. That's awesome. Let me get to now to uh, Fox Sports. I have to ask, are you a sports guy? Funnily enough, not really. <laughs> and I, <laughs> not at all, actually. And I brought, I brought that up in the interview at Fox Sports. Um, and, That's awesome. And like I, I told him, look, I know this is Fox Sports. Um, I'm not a particularly big sports fan, but I think that's my superpower. Um, Cause you guys already have a lot of really smart people working here who love their sports. What you might not have is someone who um, is the opposite of that, like who does it like their sports and um, who can bring, especially in the UX space, a very unbiased, very objective viewpoint. I don't have a particular way that I like to consume my sports. I don't have a particular um, mental model around um, my sporting experiences. Um, and, and that kind of allows me to be more open to the needs of the users and listening to the voices um, coming from our customers and from the business versus having my own way of thinking about a, a problem, which could get in the way sometimes if I'm too attached to it. Yeah. Um, and in, uh, uh, you know, I was able to, to, to sell that point successfully. And I mentioned that in the past I'd worked in uh, finance and telecoms, and I'm not particularly passionate about, you know, mortgages or cell phone towers, <laughs> but I was able to apply design thinking methodology uh, and UX practices to solve the problems that were at hand and applying it to the domain of sports would be no different to that. Um, and it, it, it was something that I, I really enjoyed doing working at Fox Sports because Sports are a domain people are very passionate about. People love their sports. When they open their sports app, they're, they're, yeah. there's passion, yeah, there's love, there's emotion, there's um, sadness, there's anger, tragedy. All those emotions are um, come, come into play and being able to facilitate experiences around something people are so involved with at a very deep level, um, to me, was, was very appealing um, as a space that I would like to work on. So. Yeah. No, that's insane. I mean, I, I think you're exactly right, because oftentimes product teams ends up being just like an echo chamber, especially think people get really passionate about the project. Uh, it just becomes an echo chamber of, I guess, these biases that inadvertently kind of creep into the product. Uh, so you've got the opportunity then to step back and say, yeah, there, there won't be a bias creeping in from my side. <laughs> I don't know. You know. Do you, have you found yourself more interested or less interested in sports since working at Fox Sports? 
To be honest, I've definitely gotten a lot more interested in it. Um, I think one of the things that helps is at, Fo uh, at Fox Sports, we have a lot of TVs all around the office and they all have sports running all the time. Um, all the channels are, you can just glance to one direction and you're watching soccer or you glance at another direction and the cricket's playing. Um, and just being really immersed in that space um, has, has really helped me start to like understand um, the, the passion and understand the, the appeal <laughs> almost. Sure. Um, and it's, it's helped me even on a personal level, my brother's big, um, soccer fan. He, he really supports Arsenal, uh, and being able to engage in those conversations <laughs> with him <laughs> has been, has been very, um, very eye opening. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's brought us closer. Yeah. Um, and, I, and, and it kind of helped me think about my craft in a, in a very different way as well. I think when, when, when you have circles of friends that are really into their sports and you might not necessarily be into the same sport or uh, follow the same team or even into sports at all, oftentimes when they're having those conversations, you might feel a little bit left out because you don't know, let me say, anything. Uh, you know, cricket or the NHL or whatever that conversation right. is about. And it's made me think about how do we make sports more accessible for people who um, might not necessarily be as involved as some of their peers or friends, uh, might be a little bit more casual, but still want to participate in that conversation. Um, and that's helped me think about how we can design experiences that improve the accessibility uh, and reduce the learning curve around uh, everything around a particular sport or a particular team, um, because I was that person who did who 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 had that learning curve problem. There would be so much for me to learn to get on the same level uh, as someone who's been a fan of a particular team or sport for since childhood, even um, so ma making that more accessible and more available and um, and, and democratizing in sport. Um, for me has been a, a new way to think about the domain. And I've really enjoyed that. Well, you know, and it's interesting because the reason I asked that question is if, you know, if working there has brought you closer or further away from sports is I would assume it by nature has to bring you a little bit closer because at the very least, even if you don't get engaged in it, even if there aren't TVs all around you sucking you into some sort of game, at the very least, you are still trying to empathize with someone who is in that world. And so I would imagine deploying empathy time and time again for somebody who's involved in that world might naturally start to pull you more into the world. That was kind of my thought. Would you say that's fair? Would you say that's happened then for you? Yeah, ab absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I think you also learn a lot by um, how the sp how sports are covered, the type of commentary that's that, that goes across it, um, the, the way it's presented um, really puts you in a sense, in the shoes of the person who's consuming this um, media, um, especially when there's big competitions and it's a kind of winner takes all situation. And these two teams have like climbed up through the ladders to get to the, um, to the finale. Um, and a, a lot is on the line. Uh, and for one side of the fence, you have heartbreak. And for another side of the fence, you have glorious victory, you know, and uh, just witnessing that is, is, is has really um, made me more passionate about that space. Yeah. I, I really understand. Um, and like even, even seeing my brother uh, and his disappointment when like Arsenal makes it like really far and then, you know, something happens and they don't progress to the next stage or they don't win, win the championship. Like I can see the emotional dynamic at play there. Um, and I can relate that to our users and our customers and how we can um, f facilitate those engaging experiences for them and, you know, make the highs higher and help with the lows and, um, you know, really help them yeah. have a fantastic experience around their sports. I always joke around that uh, I'm a big sports fan and it seems to be that my sports teams are always the ones losing. <laughs> and I always joke and say that I actually believe it's probably made me a better person because instead of reaping the benefits of always winning, I am just constantly faced with the fact that got to keep improving. Yeah. Got to keep improving. Yeah. And uh, it, it's funny how much that's become a common theme throughout my life. And as it relates to sports teams, it's spot on. 
Um, without talking sports much longer, I wanted to get into one idea and really crack the nut on something that you brought up uh, when we were having our initial phone call conversation. Uh, you brought up this idea of checklist thinking. And I want you to kind of explain to everyone listening what checklist thinking is, what we're supposed to do with it, and how you, I guess you kind of came to this uh, conclusion for yourself. Sure. Um, so checklist thinking is kind of a play on the term design thinking. Um, I think design thinking is very good intention, has a lot of great applications and methodologies. Um, whereas checklist thinking is kind of a criticism of what design thinking can devolve into in the sense that design thinking could become a process where you're ticking up items off a checklist. You're like, mm -hmm. I have a project, I need to do one, two, three, four, five equals good product. Um, and that to me is, is a problem uh, for a number of reasons. Um, one, because it can get in the, in the way of um, trying things a little bit differently from what's been done. Um, already or what's being been done for a very long time. Um, it can also not be very, can, very useful to the different ways that different designers think. Um, some designers and practitioners like having a very set process and they can follow that uh, and that can be very, very useful for them. Other designers can, are a bit more experimental, can be a bit more divergent with the way they go around solving a problem. And that's just an easier way for them or they're, they're wired more to be able to be more effective with less constraints, less limitations and being a bit more experimental with their process. Um, I think following a process is useful to, in learning the craft and gaining competency. But I think as you move towards mastery, um, you really need to find areas where you can start to bend the rules or improve the process. And you can't do that if you're just consistently following the process. Um, like a Michelin star chef isn't always following a, a recipe book exactly. Um, you know, at some point they start writing the recipe book. At some point they start experimenting with, with different aspects of the recipe. Uh, maybe instead of using sugar in a recipe, they might try a different sweetener like honey. Um, and it's about how do we initially get comfortable enough with the process where we can start playing around with the process and taking the process to the next level. So it's not a criticism of process. It's a, it's really more a criticism of rigidity um, and a lack of, um, I guess you could say boldness around breaking the rules sometimes uh, where we find it appropriate. And that comes with experience and that comes with knowing where to make the call um, to go one path versus to continue on with, um, another path. Um, and at, at the same time, I feel like that um, can, can give certain designers more clarity around a certain problem, whereas other designers following a particular process might give them less clarity because their brain operates in a different way or they're viewing it from different angles. And being a bit more dynamic, mm -hmm. uh, a bit more experimental with the process can really help a lot of designers in a lot of different ways. And I think at the same time, we need to remember that UX as a practice, as a profession is relatively young compared to some of the other domains like architecture or medicine or engineering, uh, some of which have been around for thousands of years. Um, they've had a lot of time to figure out and understand the language around their domain, the process and, um, re uh, and, and methodology around their domain, whereas UX has borrowed a lot of that, a lot of the language from spaces like anthropology, like marketing, psychology, um, you know, different d different domains around that, um, and and we've had to adapt a lot of processes from a lot of those domains as well, like industrial design. Um, I can ban and agile, and we had to bring that into, mm -hmm. into our space. Um, and we're young enough that we're still trying to find our own voice, our own language, our own uh, models and frameworks and processes. And it's okay to be a bit experimental, to diverge a little bit from, you know, a classical like double diamond model or whatever framework you name it, because we're still figuring that out. We're still young. Right. Um, and, and that's okay. 
I think a lot of designers can almost get us, especially earlier on, get a sense of imposter syndrome or doubt because they might think to themselves, I don't know all the workshops. I don't know all the artifacts and deliverables that I need to produce. Um, how is a persona different from another type of artifact or like a market segmentation or, um, you know, I don't know all the right words and I don't know all the right workshops. So I start to feel a sense of doubt. Whereas here's the thing, we're making it up as we go. The whole industry <laughs> is making it up as we go and that's fine. Um, and that's, that's the beauty of the yes. field, um, is that don't, don't feel that UX is set and structured in a certain way. We're defining what it is as we go along and it's constantly changing, um, from external forces, whether it's the industry and marketplace itself is changing, um, to the people coming into UX from different domains. So I know UXers who come in from a, um, architecture background from, uh, a pharma, pharmaceutical background, from a art history background, psychology, design, development, you name it, people are coming into the practice of UX from a lot of different domains of thinking and ways of solving types of problems. And in that way, the ecosystem of UX starts to change. Um, and I believe in a, in a very positive way, we have different ways of approaching problems. Mm -hmm. And that's where process can start to become a little bit limiting. Um, and it's okay to experiment with the process and it's okay to try to produce entirely new types of workshops, new terminologies, new words, new language, all of that. Right. It's, that's what we need because we've only been around for not that long, like compared to architecture, UX has been around for like five minutes. Right. So, okay. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of pioneering still to be done in our field. I mean, we don't have uh, the Frank Lloyd Wrights of UX quite yet, right? I mean, you've got these these big names in other industries that have, you know, they'll go back hundreds of years, but we don't have them that in UX. This is so new in so many different senses. I, I appreciate you bringing that up. Let me ask you, I so I recently started teaching a online course for entry-level UX design. And one of the things that I was surprised by in the curriculum is how long we spent in... Uh, it was about a four week stretch of class learning all about different discovery techniques and definition techniques. And it seemed like class after class after class, we were learning about a new technique. And I felt as I got through like maybe week three or four, I was like, oh my gosh, this would, this would have to be overwhelming for the students. And I always felt like I had to preface the classes with like, yeah. You guys just, you need to know when to use this because honestly, I haven't used this technique in quite some time and I understand the importance of it, but I don't use it every time. And so what I've kind of come back with this metaphor is you've got all these different tools and they're all in the toolbox and you've got to know at what point in time one tool is going to bring right value to a project that you're working on. And it doesn't mean you walk onto a project and every tool has to come out of the toolbox in order for you to get the right results, but knowing when to utilize those tools really takes you a long way. Does that go, does that run in contrast to or in parallel with your idea of avoiding checklist thinking? Yeah, no, I, th I think you nailed it. It's, um, and, and that's, that's a perfect analogy. I feel like we, UX needs more of a playbook than it needs a recipe book. We need to know when to bring out those tools um, and when, one tool might be useful to getting insight around a particular aspect of a problem versus another tool. Um, you might need, you might not need personas for a particular part of a problem, but you might need something like say, let's say a competitor analysis, for example, right. and you need to over, over time you gain experience and you learn when one tool is better than another, especially when you have a limited time frame to complete a discovery, for example. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a process might demand like 12 weeks of discovery, but the business is telling you, well, we have six weeks, three weeks, yeah. one week. One week. <laughs> what, are you gonna, <laughs> what are you going to do? Um, you know, and it's, it's uh, like, I think of it as more like chess, right? When you're playing against an opponent, um, you're not necessarily planning out the entire game ahead because you can't predict what that opponent is going to do. You need to be able to adapt to the opponent's position and over time try to move yourself towards a, uh, a more strategically optimal position in the board. 
Um, and I guess with checklist thinking, you're kind of assuming that the problem remains the same throughout the duration of the um, of, of the of, of the process. Um, whereas what you'll find is as you're diving into a problem, you'll discover certain unknowns that you didn't consider at the beginning of the problem and that you need to now shift your discovery to address that particular thing that just popped up. And that might not be in your process or in a checklist of design deliverables and artifacts that, that need to be produced uh, for the business. Um, I think another reason um, why it can be so tempting to fall into a checklist thinking type of approach is um, for a long time in UX, the business didn't necessarily fully understand what value UX added, what UX people actually did, um, what was involved and what kind of deliverables and artifacts they produced. Right. So UX started to think about, okay, what do we need to actually physically produce and present to the business to show that we've actually done work? Um, so we need to produce these things called, um, you know, journey maps or personas and hang them up on the wall and send out the PDFs and make our work visible to the business to show that UX does something. And this is the value that UX brings. Um, I think after a while, we kind of started believing that that was all of UX, that that was just what we did. Um, it, but it's not an assembly line. Um, where we just tick these things off and say, here's the stuff, here's the UX. Um, it's a, it's a, th these are artifacts that help us think differently about a problem. They can help shed mm -hmm. clarity and insight onto a problem, yeah. um, but they're not the um, output purely um, that, that, is, that addresses the problem. It, th yeah. it's, it's supposed to help us think, not necessarily supposed to help us say, we've done the thing, here you go, we're done, the UX is done, here's the discovery piece, here are all the artifacts. Um, it's like, no, these are aids, they're not, these are guides, they're not the final outcome of UX, <laughs> of discovery. Yeah, yeah. So let me ask then, because I, I know those who are listening, they're getting the, this picture that you're painting of, okay, avoid checklist thinking and avoid just going through the, the steps for the sake of the steps. Uh, their next follow-up question is going to be then, Okay, well then how do I determine where to do what? You know, how do I how do I know when it's time to break a rule? How do I know when it's time to try something else as opposed to something I've that something else that I've got on my checklist? Uh what advice do you have for them on, on knowing when to break away from checklist? Sure. I think one thing that could be particularly uh, particularly helpful is knowing what types of activities address which types of problems. So a type of a problem could be understanding the user. So what sort of things do you need to do to understand the user? You might need to de develop personas, for example, or market segmentations. Okay, what do you need to develop those artifacts? You might need some access to analytics. You might need to run certain surveys um, and these sort of things kind of branch out. So you have information sources that feed into a deliverable that is supposed to shed insight on a particular type of, pro of problem. Um, so understanding users could be one type of problem. Another type of problem could be a pure optimization problem. So is A better than B, better than C? Um, and to, to solve that type of problem, um, you might have activities associated with it like A-B testing, conversion optimization, surveys potentially, um, so on and so forth. So I think what could be helpful in the sphere of UX is um, not just having a set list of workshops and activities, and it's like use them at your um, kind of discretion, um, but group, ways of grouping these discovery activities around what type of problem they're trying to solve. I think early on in a project, we know what type of problem in a sense we're trying to solve. Okay, we need to understand the user, which helps us shed light on how to solve um, for a business problem, which might help us shed light on how to solve for another thing. Um, and, and being able to associate mm -hmm. discovery with the type of problem, the category of problem, I think can be very helpful. Um, I, you know, maybe that's something that's missing from the resources that are currently available online to UX designers. Um, maybe we have a big library yeah. of like almost an encyclopedia of tasks but they're not necessarily grouped around those types of problems. Um, I think over time, 
with experience, you start to learn where you can leverage certain activities to solve different types of problems. But early on, what you have is really just a smorgasbord of all these different workshops, all these different artifacts you can produce. And you're like, oh, well, okay, I should mm -hmm. just do all of them. <laughs> but you have one week <laughs> to do that discovery. So you have to, you have to be yeah. mindful of that. Um, and yeah, I, I think a good place to start for it when yeah. you, if, early on, when you're not sure which type of research to do is to be very clear on what type of problem you're trying to solve. And once you know that, that will lend itself to revealing what type of activities, what type of analytics, what type of workshops you can run to shed light on the problem rather than let's just produce artifacts and try to extract insights out of them. Yep. No, and I think that's spot on because what you're describing is more of like the critical thinking behind choosing the tool in your toolbox, right? And the light bulb moment that I just had while you're explaining that was like before we had even some of the tools that we currently have, or I guess more of the thoughts around, uh, you know, you can do focus groups and you can do surveys and you can do personas and you can do all these types of things. Before we had any of that really kind of set in stone or, or in this checklist, it all came back to someone critically thinking through what value they needed to accomplish and then figuring out how could I go about getting that? You know, so if somebody was thinking like, Hmm, I wonder which of these ideas would resonate with the most people. Well, you know what? I probably just need to ask as many people as possible and I need to find a way to, to get that feedback. Okay. So I need to put together some sort of a survey, right? And so all that came back to someone at some point in time was doing the critical thinking, was doing everything that you're talking about right now. And by so doing that, we now have this option of like, that tool is now called surveying. <laughs> but there's other tools that we, we haven't even discovered yet because of how new this field is that still need to be determined based upon us using you know, the brain, based upon us doing some critical thinking to try and discover what value we need to cross the finish line. Yeah, yeah. and that's, that's the distinction between checklist thinking and design thinking. It's so like design thinking is really the application of that critical thinking, whereas checklist thinking is really... I've got a, I've got a list of d things I can tick off and that equals something supposedly, uh, which is mm -hmm. not always the case. Um, I'm, it's not necessarily saying that having a checklist and doing certain things is useful and it definitely can be, but knowing where you can be a little bit flexible, a little bit more um, dynamic around those, those, those deliverables and knowing why you're producing those things is is the most yep. important things like are you just producing um personas for the sake of sticking them up on the wall and then the business like claps for you for five minutes and then no one looks at those personas ever again <laughs> um, so what was the point in that right um, you know so it, it's really about understanding why you're doing a certain thing and yep. being deliberate and mindful about that task um, because i guess the, the benefits of that is you become a better designer you're not just assembling a product, you're designing a product. Um, and furthermore, you're being more efficient with the time that you've got, because you won't always have all the time in the world to do the best possible discovery. So you might have to prioritize. So you become better at prioritizing. You become better at producing um, more value for the business in less time and extracting more insights in less time um, and, and knowing when to do something and when not to do something are equally as important. Um, and that's, that's the, that's, yeah. that's what true design thinking is. Yeah. Um, you know, earlier you were saying that we need a playbook and not necessarily a recipe book and going back to that metaphor, a, a good playbook isn't finished either. A good playbook still has room to grow and expand. And by doing some of these application pieces that you're talking about, that's where we start to expand the playbook. You know, you always leave your option open for, we've learned something at this point in time, and next time around, we're gonna run this play instead of that play, and we can get the, a different value or the same value done in a better way. The options are limitless as you start to think about it in that mindset. I really appreciate that metaphor. Thank you, absolutely. We are just about out of time and uh, I can't actually can't believe how fast that flew by. <laughs> uh, but anyone listening, Kiro, you've got a, a jackpot worth of 
wealth and information here uh, for for UX designers. So I want to encourage those who are listening to to look you up, to find you. Where would you like them to find you at? Uh, sure. So you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, uh, just uh, look up Kirilos Saman. Uh, my name will be spelled out in the uh, description. Um, or you could go to my website, kiro.com.au. Uh, that's spelled K-Y-R-O.com.au. Um, also, if you're interested in uh, some UX resources and a huge library of that, feel free to check out userexperience.guide, which is spelled exactly how, you, how those words are spelled. <laughs> um, and you'll find a, a huge resource um, of UX templates, books, podcasts, um, you name it, everything around UX. I'm trying to aggregate it into in one space and, and provide that for the community. So yeah, check that out and I uh, hope you enjoy it. And how long have you been working on that resource? So UX, user experience guide, the, the, the resources for that I've been collecting over years, oh, wow. um, from PDFs to the podcasts that I listen to, to, you know, articles that I found on, on medium or whatnot that I found useful around the domain. I've been aggregating them all in one page, one place. Um, and, uh, yeah, just more recently, probably the last couple of months, I've been a bit more formal about the way that's presented and organized and turn it into the website user experience guide. Um, and when you access the website today, um, what you'll find is a link that says preview resources. If you click on that, it'll take you to a notion space, which is a great, um, collaboration tool where all those resources are hosted in the background. I'm working on a proper website where those web, where the, all those resources will actually be, uh, living. Um, so that's, that'll be coming soon. Yeah. Stay tuned for that. Awesome. Kira, thank you so much for the time. You, you are a, a gentleman for, uh, you know, allow me to to put together this little uh this little piece here i know our time schedules were quite conflicting i did not mean to originally schedule it for what was it 1 a.m or 2 a.m the first time I <laughs> well, 1 a.m on monday morning <laughs> the mountain standard time conversion to australian time wasn't working how i thought it was working so anyways i appreciate your flexibility uh your stud and i hope to stay in touch with you and uh again thank you so much for everything you've done my pleasure thank you for having me on all the best Absolutely. That's a wrap for design today. Uh, we'll see you next week.